So today's topic is um, a, a really short and interesting and intriguing Mishnah in the chapters of the Fathers. The chapters of the Fathers, of course, is a collection of ethical and philosophical, even some theological teachings uh, culled from the, from the teachers of the Mishnah, from the authors of the Mishnah, Tanaim. Now, what's very interesting about this book is that the first teaching of the whole book uh, seems a little bit out of place. If you read it, it talks about Moshe getting the Torah from the Almighty and giving it to, to Joshua, who passed it on to the leaders of the, of the Jewish people of the next generation, and eventually like, kind of it went to, from generation to generation until it reached the author of the first Mishnah. And the common lesson, or, or, the, or the commonly accepted lesson of that first Mishnah is that despite the fact that these are ethical teachings... Their ethical teachings from Sinai. So even though we have, you know, it, it, it quotes the, the, you know, the, the rabbi, the teacher, the sage, who personified this lesson. But the lessons are part of the, you know, greater corpus of Jewish teachings that's been given and been tra- part of the tradition from Sinai. So that kind of raises the profile of these teachings. And thus, when we read this one, which sounds a little bit um, I, I would say certainly dramatic, uh, or it's uh, you know it's it's no it's it's not a small teaching. It's not it's 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 uh, putting itself out there, so to speak. It's making very bold. Sta- it's a very bold statement, uh, but we should know that according to Jewish tradition, this stems all the way back from Moses at Sinai. So let me read to you what this says, and we'll kind of re- revisit the actual text of the Mishnah several times. So it starts off, Rabbi Nechunya ben Hakana Omer. So the author of this idea is a fellow by the name of Rabbi Nechunya, the son of Hakana. That was his name. Hakana, w- did you say? That's, what he, that, that's his name, Hakana. I don't know why he had that name, but that was his name. His, his dad's name. Nechunya ben Hakana. Kol hamekabel alav ol Torah. Whoever accepts upon themselves the yoke of Torah... They remove from him the yoke of the kingdom and the yoke of the way of life. And whoever casts off the yoke of Torah from upon himself, then the yoke of the kingdom and the yoke of the way of life is placed upon them. So essentially what it's saying is that if you accept upon yourself yoke of Torah, of course, what that actually means is going to be a large segment of what we're going to try to, you know, to try to find out. But if someone accepts upon themselves the yoke of Torah, then the previous yokes that may have been on someone's shoulders are removed. What are those two yokes? The yoke of the kingdom and the yoke of the way of life. Now, if someone has the yoke of Torah on their shoulders and then they say, ah, I'm done with this yoke of Torah, I want to cast it off, then in its place, the yoke of the kingdom and the yoke of the way of life are, are placed. That's, that, that's where the Mishnah begins and ends. Now, I think the, the initial analysis of this Mishnah really tells us something very intriguing. What does the Mishnah say? If you accept one yoke, yoke of Torah, then you lose the other yoke, yoke of kingdom, yoke of way of life. But, so those are the two options. You're going to have a yoke of Torah and thus lose the yoke of kingdom and and the way of life, or you're going to cast away the yoke of Torah and then you'll have the yoke of kingdom and the yoke of way of life placed in its stead. There doesn't seem to be a third option. The option of having no yoke at all, well, that's not in the Mishnah. Everyone, you just, you get to choose which yoke you want to have on your shoulders, but the option of having no yoke whatsoever, well, that's not here. It's either yoke of Torah or yoke of kingdom and uh, and way of life. And now that's very interesting. There's no way to have a carefree, easy life. There's no way to not have any yoke. And not only that, like, uh, what what does a yoke mean? A yoke is a term for, um, most typically used for an animal. You have an animal plowing, you put a yoke on it, and then kind of it's, 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 it, you, it submits itself to you. You become the master over 
it. When the animal has a yoke in it, it knows it's got to do, it. it's just got to do its work. So here we're told, it seems like we're encouraged to accept upon ourselves a yoke of Torah. Doesn't sound like something we should want to do, right? Yoke is responsibility, it's commitment, it's, it's something we cannot escape from. It's, it, we have to submit ourselves. We lose flexibility. We're like the animal, so to speak. We have a yoke on our shoulders. No, no, we were talking about an actual yoke like they put on, on, on an ox. When you, want to, you want the ox to plow your field. This is something we're not so familiar with. I think the imagery would have been a lot more striking and familiar to us 200 years ago when we would have all been farmers. But if a farmer wants to have the ox plow his field, you put a yoke on the, on, on the shoulders of the ox, and the ox now does whatever you want it to do. Well, the older ox, the older ox is there to instruct. Yes, yeah, so sometimes there's, there's a yoke that's, that, that attaches yeah. two animals together so they work in unison. But this is like a very interesting term that we're applying to ourselves. That we take a yoke and put it on ourselves, and there's a yoke of Torah, and there's a yoke of a kingdom, and the way of life. And if you accept upon yourself the yoke of Torah, then the other yokes will get removed. So what is a yoke of way of life? Well, that's, we're going to have to try to examine that question. Well, what does this mean? But I, I think initially, the initial insight, which to me was a big, a big discovery, is that w- our choices, like well, the options that we have, are which yoke. There's no option of no yoke whatsoever. It seems like there are certain parts of the equation that are not in our control. There's no way for someone to say, I'm not going to have anything that's going to be my yoke. Now, what that means, we'll have to try to see what that, that means. That could have been in the Garden of Eden, but... That, that, Maybe. that May- option was eliminated, right? It, it, as if to say that here in this world, we're here to work. In fact, there's a, a verse somewhere in Scripture that says, Adam la'amal yulad, man was created for toil. It means that there, toil is something that's, that, that, that part is constant. The question is, where are we going to direct our toil? I'm assuming this is only for men. No, why is this only for men? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, we'll see what Yoga of Torah actually means because we'll find some interesting, um, interesting uh, um, descriptions of what that actually means. So what was interesting to me uh, about this, uh, when I was thinking about it, I remember there's this, um, there's this saying that we say at the end that when we make a siyum, a siyum is a completion. You complete a book of Talmud, you complete a book of Mishnah, there's a, a, a set text that is traditionally said at the celebration of a completion of a book of Talmud. And part of the text is um, what I thought was very relevant to what we're saying. And then I'm researching it last night, and what do I discover? The author of that text, and I'll read to you in a second, that text that we say at the end of a completion of a book of Talmud is the same author of our Mishnah. He's not, not very well... Uh, he, the, the, this Rabbi Nechon ben Akan is very infrequently mentioned. And then I discover this Mishnah and the text that we read at the end of a completion of a book of Talmud, they're both authored by him, and it's, they seem to be sharing this common characteristic. I want to read to you what, what this text is. We thank you, our God, the, and the God of our forefathers, that you, this is what we say when we finish a book of, of, of Torah, that you placed our portion of amongst those who sit in the house of study, but you didn't place our portion amongst those who sit and waste their time. Why? Because we wake up, and they wake up early. Everyone wakes up early. But we wake up to study Torah, and they wake up to, 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 to things that are a waste of time. We toil, and they toil. We toil and get reward. They toil, and they don't get reward. We run, and they run. We run to Olam Abba, and they run to bear shachas, which either means the grave or means hell. That's that snippet. To me, what's interesting is not the fact that some of us run and some of us toil and some of us wake up in the morning early and some of us don't. That's not the equation. What he does is he puts us, the, the toil and the effort, that is steady, that's constant. Right. The yoke, there is a yoke on, on, on everyone. The only question is, which yoke are we going to choose? Are we going to choose to run after Torah, to get up early to study Torah, to pursue Torah and chase after Torah, to accept upon ourselves the yoke of Torah, or are we going to accept upon ourselves the yoke of kingdom or the yoke of the way of life? 
And that's what we, that will be what we pursue. That will be what, it, what our yoke is. And, of course, that will be what we wake up early to do and we toil over. Now, I think this is describing, like, this is describing a commitment. You know, we talk about something that you wake up early to do, something that you toil over, something that you submit yourself towards. That's much more than something that you do, right? Uh, something that you do on the weekends, right, that doesn't count as your yoke, right? Your yoke is whatever you wake up early to do, what you toil over, what you pursue, what's your central life goal. That's what your yoke is. And, you know, I, I, reading this, we have a question that we could ask, you know, is it not good enough to just to study Torah, to observe Torah, to have Torah as being a central part of our, of our life? The, 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 this Mishnah is, is, is talking about a much higher level. It's not just having Torah as a factor in, in, of a collection of influences in our life. It's the central core focus. This is what I wake up early to do. This is what, I, this is what I'm concerned with. This is what I toil over. This is what I'm my central pursuit in life. This is my yoke. And if you have that, that's the key to get rid of all the other stresses in life. And I, and I, and I want to kind of present this in, in two different ways. You know, what happens when someone wakes up and they decide they don't, they don't want to go to work? What a hassle, you got to deal with your boss, your coworkers. Oh, what a schlep, it's, it's only Monday, right? You still have a whole bunch of, day, a bunch of days to the weekend. So you call in sick, right? Right, but you have, you're out of sick days. You get up and you go to work. You go to work. Right. Why? Because you, you have to go to work because you just have to. Even if you're not interested in it. What if you're not interested? You go anyhow. You've got to do it, right? That's a yoke. That's a yoke. You are submitted to doing this, whether you like it or not. You're in the mood. You're not in the mood. This is what you're doing. It's kind of like parenting. I would say parenting. <laughs> uh, dare I say, it's like marriage as well. Right? Someone says, oh, today I'm not in the mood of being a good spouse. I- I'm not in the mood. So you can't have yours like that. But that is not an option. There's no option of no ha- having no yoke, right? If you want to make it work, you have to have a yoke. So I, I think... You know, and I, we found some examples in. in well, some, there's quite a few people that don't that, that shirk that yoke every day. Okay, so then those are those people really living? Maybe we could say. That's yeah. a different question. That's an interesting question. Yes, uh, but those people are not a part of our equation. Now, um, I uh, I found uh, an, an essay that my grandfather wrote about this, and he he compared this to. Um, Somebody said the yoke of Torah to, to like a soldier, right? The soldier in the army, they do what they're told. If they're in the mood of it, if they're not in the mood of it, they get up at the right time and they do all their duties and they just, you know, that's what they need to do because that's what a soldier does. Uh, another example the Torah brings about, uh, uh, about Yisachar. Yisachar is one of Jacob's sons who is renowned for Torah study. And it describes him as a donkey, uh, where he just has this yoke on him, and he just does, he just does the work. Do you, do you ask him before, are you in the mood of it? Does anyone ask their donkey before they put it into uh, the day's work, uh, is today a good day? You know, can we do the work today? No. Whether they're interested or not, if they have the yoke on it, they have to do it. Um, and also... I think a yoke can also be understood as the pursuit or the focus that dominates our mind, our conscious, even when we're not engaged with it. So you have someone who's, who's involved in a project, and they're committed to it, and they're, even when they're out of work, they're still thinking about it. You know, it's still churning over in their heads. It's not something that is a nine-to-five, right? Sometimes you have a nine-to-five, you come in, you clock in, you do your work, you clock out. You know, that's something that's more perfunctory. You're just doing it because you need to do it, right? A yoke is, is something that you do whether or not you want to do it as well, like it's, you're committed to it, but also it's something that's constantly with you. Uh, so, for example, the, that aforementioned uh, comparison 
of to the commitment that we have to have to Torah or that Yisachar had to Torah as a donkey, the difference between a donkey and a horse with regards to uh, transportation is that if you put a load on the donkey, uh, you put a load on the horse and you travel, but you got to have a pit stop overnight. So what you do is you take the load off the horse, let the horse kind of play around and, you know, kind of roam, for, roam free during the breaks. As opposed to a donkey, a donkey rests with a load on it. Really? Yeah, that's, that's what it said. Yeah, it means the, the load just stays there, and they rest, and they can sleep while standing with a load on, on their back. So what does that have to do with the donkey representing physicality? How do you equate, how do you marry this to concept? Uh, that's, I thought about that as well. That's very interesting. Uh, I would say that we're not looking at we're not looking at uh, the the comparison to a donkey is just the commitment. Um, someone could be like the donkey for good or for bad, or for good or for not good. Right? The, 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 that's the commitment, and that maybe kind of shows us what the danger is of being of being of having the yoke of the way of life on us, because that means that. We're totally committed to things that are not going to help us, kind of in the big picture. It's not going to help our soul, for, for so example. You didn't define what the yoke of life. I'm sorry, yoke of the way of life. That's right. We haven't defined that yet. That's right. That's right. So because the, there's a big questions about that, what that actually means. I found a, I found a few interpretations. Taking care of your family is it one of those, and then it becomes so you would rather study Torah than feed your children. No, that's not what it means. That's a Yes, that's, that's, that's not what we'll get to. That, we'll get to that in, in, in a little bit. So I think just what is Yoke of Torah? Yoke of Torah is A, it's a description of commitment irrespective of you know, the day to day or the minute to minute interest in it. Someone could say, I, I study Torah, I'm in the mood. When I'm not in the mood, I don't study Torah. Well, then that's not a yoke. But also, uh, even when they're kind of not directly involved, it's still, it's still, it's you know, it's still percolating, so to speak, in their mind. So um, like center, like the it's the center. It's the core. It's it's the core. Now, um, the. Maybe that's a good analogy. It's always there. I mean, you, even when you leave it, you don't abandon it. Even if you're not traveling and carrying this load, you don't cast it off of you. Some of the ones compare this to Joshua. So Moses goes up uh, to Mount Sinai, and he goes up, and there's the Ten Commandments and that wonderful revelation at Sinai. And then he goes up to the mountain, and he's out, he's out for 40 days and 40 nights. So what does everyone do? Everyone says, okay, let's go back to the camp, and let's wait for Moshe to come back. But Joshua, Joshua remained at the foot of the mountain for the entirety of those 40 days. Question is why? Moshe you know Moshe's not coming back for 40 days and 40 nights, right? You know that. So why would you not go back to your, to the, you know, to your camp, to the camp, to your tent, to where everyone else was? Why did Joshua decide to stay at the foot of the mountain when he knows that Moshe's not coming back for four days, he could have said, you want to, you want to be there when Moshe comes back down? Okay, so, so you know, so go leave now, go back to the, the community, the, you know, the, the people, and then after 40 days, come back and greet him when he comes back down. Why did, why did he, he not want to leave? And the answer, they say, is that Joshua, even though he's not, Joshua is the, is the consummate student, and he wants to be with Moshe all the time to study, study Moshe. <laughs> Now, of course, whenever he could be with Moshe, that's great. But he doesn't want to abandon Moshe. It's not just that. I mean, even, even at, at the time when, when he, Moshe cannot be there to teach him, if he left the site of where Moshe went, then that would be as if he's leaving, as if he's casting off this proverbial yoke, so to speak. And that's his commitment uh, uh, as a student to Moshe, that he's, he's a student and he's always a student, and he's never going to say, I'm, for now, for 40 days, I'm not a student. Now, it's interesting that the Talmud does talk about uh, the yoke of marriage. 
as well. The, the same words that are used uh, for the yoke of Torah, same words, all Torah is called, is, is the yoke of marriage as well, uh, which is interesting uh, because I think this is a very powerful lesson that unfortunately our society really does not uh, espouse necessarily. Um, in fact, my grandfather wrote a, uh, a small little work on uh, pre-marital um, lessons for prospective brides and grooms. Uh, and so there's a little pamphlet, one for the boys and one for the girls. And it's about, it's about preparing yourself to be a good spouse, to, be, you know, to, to have a successful marriage. And the way it starts off, so I have this translated into English. It starts off as a conversation, a dialogue between a sage and a, and a groom. And they're having a discussion. And it starts off like this. And the sage asks the groom, what do you think is the proper, proper foundation on which you want to establish your, your home, your family, your life together, your mutual life together? So what is kind of the thing that's going to keep it together? Like what... On what is this relationship based? So he says, what do you mean? It's, it's love, it's understanding. That's what it is, right? That's what, that's what we think, right? So the sage tells him, no, 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 no. I, just, I thought you would answer like this, but you're wrong. And I'm going to say something that's going to shatter your rosy fantasies. <laughs> and he says, listen, I'm going to say it the way it is, because I'm trying to prepare you for life. And it's good to be realistic about what's going to happen to you and what the fundamentals of marriage are all about. He says, the reality is completely different than what you think. Completely. And he said like this, it's very likely that after your marriage, you will discover differences of opinion between you and your, and your wife in certain things, you will come to realize that there is absolutely no understanding between you two. There's no understanding. No, there is no understanding. Sorry, there is no understanding. So now you're going to base your marriage on mutual understanding, and then there is no mutual understanding. And what's going to happen? Are you say love? What do you mean love? You say, the, he quotes the, the Talmud. The Talmud says is that only unconditional love is going to stand. The only thing, you can only rely, if there's any conditions in love, then you never know if it's going to stand. If the love is dependent on something else, it could very well turn into genuine hatred. So let me ask you a question. If un- mutual understanding is not going to keep your marriage together, because there are things that you'll have no understanding whatsoever, and love, how can you be certain that your love is completely unconditional? What then are you going to have that's going to keep your marriage together? These are good questions. And by the way, we don't hear these things either. Like in today's society, it's like love, understanding... And he's, well, this, you know, this is brass tacks, right? What's good, what is going to make sure that your marriage is going to, is going to have uh, f- you know, firm roots to ensure that you know, you'll love each other and you'll grow and you'll develop and you'll build a beautiful family and you won't get divorced and you'll be, you'll be happy together? What's going to hold it together? So the, 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 the groom is, of course, a little taken aback. He says, well, what do you mean? I think we can have real love. And, of course, I'm talking about real love and not kind of fake love. He didn't respond unconditional love. Yeah, so he says, he says, you're right. The sage tells you, right. Nevertheless, your, is love alone the foundation of a home? We're talking about living together day after day, year after year for the remainder of your life in different situations, different moods, different temperaments. And every home has something that kind of some moments of temper, so to speak, that can flare up. And it's very likely that your love is going to turn into hate. Right? Hopefully, of course, these times are, are very seldom. But what supports the home in situations like this so that the differences and the disagreements do not increase and the home, God forbid, won't be destroyed? So the groom tells him, I don't know, man, you're scaring me. I hope we won't reach this. Ah, says the sage, my intention is not to scare you, but to calm you down and to show you what the strong foundations uh, that support the home at all times. And he quotes... What the verse says in Eichon, Lamentations, it is good, it is favorable for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. What does that mean? The yoke of a wife. This is the cornerstone of, of your marriage. Getting married means accepting the yoke of your wife. And bearing this yoke in every situation, 
and never casting it off. And that's how he begins. The yoke of his wife? Oh, uh, is that what you said? The yoke of your wife, that's right. So husband what, is like an ox. The, the point is like this, and he, um, he, he goes on he goes on to explain he goes on to explain what that means. That's why Genesis says you can leave your family and go to your wife. That's right. It means you're accepting upon yourself something. You know, that's, that's an interesting thing, because when people ask me how long we've been married, I say, well, I have 58 years of very happy marriage. That's not bad out of 61. <laughs> not bad. There's always difference in that. Right, but what what interest? And he goes on. The whole book is essentially about a whole pamphlet is about is about this idea that we kind of I, I think certainly our society tells us is that you get married, it's so lovely, it's so nice, and it is lovely and it is nice. But certainly in in, in a Jewish marriage is all about making sure that this is firm, that this is well established, this has has good foundations. And and how do you do it? The Talmud tells us, the quotes a verse in, in, in scripture, it says it's about, it's about a yoke. And that means that you're accepting upon yourself some resp- responsibility and commitment. And what if you're not in the mood? Like we said, what does a yoke mean? It means, what, oh, no, what if, what if uh, they, I'm not so interested? You still go to work, right? That's your yoke. You still study Torah. That's your yoke. You still treat your wife with the love and, and, and care and concern and empathy and attention that she needs. And that ensures that even when you're not in the mood, you're still, you're still a good husband and that will make sure that your marriage will last. Rabbi, um, not to jump the gun, but did your grand, you said your grandfather wrote this pamphlet, one for yeah. grooms and one for brides. Yes. Okay, now is the one for the bride Oh, it's totally different. Oh my gosh. Okay. It sounds to me, though, just not having heard the one, like, really yeah. the, just the one about the responsibilities of husband, it sounds like what you're saying, that the responsibility for the marriage falls largely with the husband. Well, they both have different roles, but but yeah, the responsibilities are on both of them. But the and we're, it, who's told these things nowadays? No one, right? Isn't the Hebrew word for marriage something similar to like to carry or something? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Nisuin means to carry, to bear. Uh, if you notice, there's this um, ceremony under the Jewish chuppah on the canopy where the bride surrounds the groom seven times, and the symbolism behind that is that they're kind of getting bound together. And this is just the way it is. Like this is your yoke being placed on your shoulders, and that's the way it is. You're handcuffed. Now, the the problem with with that is that with, it sounds like it's oh, what do you mean? Where's my emergency exits? But that's the thing. If you want to have so many emergency exits available for you, you'll probably go for one of those emergency exits when things get bad. But there invariably there's you know there's the rhythm of marriage, and invariably things will come up that'll you know that will cause tension. And the question is, do you say I have a yoke and responsibility? I'm committed. I'm doing this. Then you get through them, you know. Otherwise, if you're just expecting love and mutual understanding to carry you to the promised land, it'll work, you know. Sometimes and sometimes it won't work, and then that could be very devastating for a relationship, and certainly in its uh, nascent uh, stages. Yeah. Are those translated yeah. And are they available so people buy them? Oh. Well, it's funny. Uh, my grandfather was so protective over these little pamphlets. That like he wouldn't give it to someone unless they showed him like an invitation, like that he's engaged, and, like right now. You know. what, what, what yes, they are available, and they are. I I translated them to English. Um, so you would like to distribute those to us, yes? <laughs> uh, well, I only translated the one for men. I actually never read cover to cover the one for. Begin where you are. <laughs> when you Maybe it felt pending good behavior. <laughs> When you say who te- teaches this anymore, I mean, you're raising the point, very, very valid, I think, that they're not taught enough anymore, but don't most spiritual marriage, and when I say I'm talking about, as opposed to if someone gets married by a judge, where this I'm sure isn't discussed, or probably isn't discussed, don't most, rela- if, if you get married in a, in, a, in a synagogue or if you get married, if you get married by a rabbi or if you get married by a clergyman, aren't these things discussed? I mean, you know, I hope so. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who discusses it. The Talmud says it. This is what it is. You marry, and, you know, who, who presents it in such, a, in such a way? But this is very valuable because if you have this attitude, your marriage is going to work. It's going to work. It's, your brother you know. came with Oh, yeah. 
And the question is like... It was mind-boggling. But, but we, we know that marriage, certainly in America today, it's... It, the failure rates are astounding. So clearly our society is not doing something... is doing something wrong about this. Well, it and then, coincides with the decrease in church going, and, and, and doesn't it? I mean, uh, isn't that... Uh, well, a, I think a certainly... Uh, Actually, it's not that I would, astounding. Uh, marriage, divorce rates among college-educated is less than 10%. It's among those with the less high school degree or less. It's about are you sure about, about that? that? Absolutely. You well, of course. Well, of, of course. Is, but 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 is 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 marriage success rates only about divorce rates? You know, I think that there's there's other areas. Does marriage live up to its billing as two people becoming one and really unified? And you know, th- does that even in cases where there's no divorce, right? Probably, if, not. Probably not. Right. You wouldn't stay married for twenty five years or for thirty five years if you. Divorce is expensive. Work, right. <laughs> Yeah, but sometimes, sometimes, yeah, unfortunately, there's sometimes there's there's marriages where there, there really isn't a lot of. Compatibility. It's just it, 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 no compatibility, but cert, but like the, there's the, you know there's two. They have two beds and two TV remotes and two cars and two lives really, and that's I think very yeah, devastating. Yeah. When my wife and I got married, she was living with a uh, a roommate who worked for a psychologist for marriage. So she sent home a test for me to take and for Ellie to take. And so we both filled out our own tests and everything like that. And they sent it back to her roommate. She took it back to the psychologist. And the psychologist said, these two people are getting married. (laughs) It'll never last. (laughs) They're just complete opposites. So at which oh, point? Oh, been married 61 years. At which point? In, 50, in 58, we're 58 happy. 58 happy, yeah. <laughs> 58, we're happy. Have been happy. Yeah, 58, we're happy out of 61. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's going to be difficulties in there, but we never considered divorce. Great. Never did. We'll work through what we've got, and we, we have four kids and a bunch of grandkids and great-grandkids. Mm-hmm. It can be done. So, uh, yoke, huh? Yoke of Torah and yoke of, uh, yoke of Merida. Very interesting. Um, I am interested, maybe this isn't part of the discussion, but the pamphlet for the bride, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we have exhausted the mention. <laughs> What's interesting is that, um, it, from what I've seen, they're very different. I have a copy of both of them. I should probably read, read the one from the brides. But it sounds like the bride one isn't part of this discussion, or at least that's... Well, I, I'm not it. so familiar with it. I read the one for the grooms, so don't look at me, right? But, well, maybe um, we need your wife in here uh, for, uh, for, that, for that, that session. I think she mentioned that, like, uh, that, that in it it said something to the effect that, like, men sometimes throw their socks on the floor, and that's okay. Something like that. I'm sure that was not part of it. I, that's what she said. I don't know. I've never read it. Well, that like sometimes you know play, yeah. men are a little bit kind of you know messier and something like that and that's okay and doesn't mean modern uh, secular men are from Mars women are from Venus. <laughs> yeah it's something it like that. Like <laughs> well, um, I, I, and to me this was also interesting because we said the yoke of Torah is something that you, you kind of think about even when you're not directly involved and I, I think this does translate really nicely to the yoke of marriage. I think a marriage would be successful if if certainly if the man is thinking about the woman. Even when they're not together, that that I think is a is a wonderful tool to make their relationship deepen. Like if if the woman knows the man is thinking about her, even when they're not together, like it's still it's he's you know she's still accompanying him in his thoughts, um, i.e. he still has the yoke of her so to speak with him at all times. Uh, it does wonders uh, for the relationship. Now, well, we're told that that there's this idea of yoke of Torah. Uh, I think that uh, it follows the same line. It's total commitment, but also it's, it's total submission of ourselves to the concept, to God, to God, really. Uh, now, what's interesting is, is that we're told by accepting the yoke of God of Torah, 
we're going to get rid of other yokes, I think is, it's interesting, especially in light of what we've talked about in, in, in recent weeks, that there is this idea of, of God, of course, and then there's this idea of a foreign God uh, within us, that the Yetzirah, uh, he fills this role of an alternative to God. Where is, you know, he kind of does, does the same role. He, he, he could tell us how to behave and how to not behave and what to do and everything like that, just like we know that the Almighty does. And I think that, that, that in the undercurrents of this Mishnah, it's really going back to the central idea of what life really is about. It's about trying to unseat the foreign God within us and supplant him with the Almighty. And thus, yes, we're going to have a God, we're going to have a yoke regardless. The question is, is it the real God created of heaven and earth? Or is this the, 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 you know, the fake one? The, the God that kind of usurps God and ensconces himself in your life and directs you how to behave. What's also interesting to me from this Mishnah is that we're talking very early on in the game you know, someone accepts upon themselves the yoke. Well, what happens then? What happens once someone has the yoke? Well, then they behave in a way that the yoke tells them to behave. So whether or not the yoke is the yoke of Torah or the yoke of kingdom or the yoke of the way of, of life, that, you know, th- you know, that's already, you know, post facto. But initially, which yoke are you accepting? Once you made that decision, at that point in the timeline that the rest of it is almost assured. Another example here. There's a, another statement to the Talmud that says, it talks about two people, someone who wants to become pure and someone who wants to become impure. And that's really the choice. The choice is which path are we going to begin but once you're on a path, then everything else kind of falls into place. So if you choose the path of coming to purify, to accept upon itself the yoke of Torah, then everything else that happens is not even discussed in the Mishnah. Well, what happens when someone has the yoke of Torah? That's already assured once the yoke of Torah has been accepted. Well, what happens to someone who accepts upon themselves the yoke of kingdom and the way of life? Well, that's not even discussed because that's already, once this yoke is accepted, then everything else is, is guaranteed. Thus, really the, the point of, of the bifurcation of options is all the way at the beginning of accepting which yoke you're going to choose, which is very interesting to me. Now back to your question, Vitaly. So what does this mean, the yoke of the, of the kingdom, the way of life? So, the way of the land. So, um, I found different interpretations, but they all seem to kind of follow along the same line, and then I found one dramatic idea that I think uh, really resonates. So, uh, the various uh, opinions were that uh, kingdom means, well, that's the rules, that's the laws, that's taxes, that's our, you know, the king says what you got to do, you got to do. You're, you know, you're a subject to the king. Whatever they say is what you have to do. And sometimes, of course, the kings weren't so uh, benevolent. And the king would, would have to conscript armies and have to assemble taxes. And that's just miserable living under, uh, under such tyranny. And that, of course, you know, really takes a toll on a person when they have to live in, in, a, in you know, under leadership that is uh, that is um, that marginalizes their way of life. That's it. Government, the IRS. That yes, yes, that's right. Um, the IRS, yes, uh, and <laughs> toil of of Derek Harris' way of life. The the the, the common consensus is, is that that's making a living, making a livelihood. The way of life, you gotta, you know, everyone's got to work, everyone's got to make a living. Um, it's labor, is it, is it labor, is it work in the fields, or is it working uh, as an accountant, whatever it is, but the point is, is that's just what really dominates us. You know, we, you know wake up early, you got to, you know, beat the traffic, you know, spend some time in the subway, deal with coworkers, have quarterly performance reviews, you know, that's the toll. Regardless of your commitment to Torah, you still need to go to work. Even oh, so, my, uh, Rambam said that. Oh, okay, so we have to see how that works. So that, that's really the clincher, right? How is it possible someone accepts upon themselves the yoke of Torah and then they are absolved from any other yoke? So I want to read to you here a fascinating uh, commentary that I found here. 
because this really flips it on its head. He says it like this. What are the ways of the world? How, so to speak, does the Almighty treat us? Right? So you said, you don't, you, don't, you don't work, you don't eat, you don't have a job. How are you going to pay for, you know, how are you going to pay for food, for your mortgage? How are you going to pay for your car? How are you going to do it? And that's what he calls the way of the world. The way of the world is if you want to have food, you want to have your needs met, you've got to plow, you've got to plant, etc., this is what you need. The world needs that, and that's, but that's, that's one mode. It's what he calls it nature. That's just the way it is. That's the way the Almighty set it up. It's the way of the world, and the way of the world is, is that you want to eat, you want to drink, you want to take care of your family, you want to pay your mortgage, you have to have a job, and you have to follow you know, the prescription that the world really has for us. I'm not trying to break, break a political issue. I'm just curious. Does that imply that the scriptures say that there isn't any room for a welfare state in this? Well, the welfare state that we actually read this past week in the Parsha, the welfare state is a responsibility of the community. The question is... If it someone should, can't work, but what about people who choose not to work? People who choose... Well, the halacha is that you have to help your fellow provided that they're trying to help themselves. That's a halacha. So, for example, um, there's a mitzvah in the Torah that if your neighbor is unloading their donkey or their, their horse or whatever, or maybe taking their groceries, you've got to help them. You can't just see... Some, you can't see your neighbor f- you're faltering and you... Is that standing by where your neighbor bleeds? Is that the uh, no, that's not that verse, that's but that. it's, it's a similar idea. But, it says, azov ta azov imo. You have to help him. But, yeah, but with him, if he's if he says if he's lying on the grass and saying, oh, "My neighbors will take care of all my responsibilities," then you then you're not obligated by the Torah to help them. That being said, uh, so, so that, that's 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 one uh, arena. Um, charity. We just read this week's, past week's parsha <coughs> that there's always going to be poor people. There's always going to be uh, there's always going to be poor people. So the the the, uh, the uh, socialist uh, uh, panacea doesn't exist. It's not possible to eradicate poverty, poverty uh, in, completely. And that's by design. That's the way the Almighty sets it up. Uh, and that enables us to help others, to, to be magnanimous, to, you know, to, if, everyone, if we're all the same, then we wouldn't be able to help our fellow. Isn't that the fundamental story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, that's where they failed, right? Yeah, that was in what? In helping I think what you're referring to is a nanny state. Well, yeah, yeah. and, I mean, and also it doesn't say anything. It doesn't say anything about. It doesn't say anything about about the government. The question is, this is a mitzvah. The mitzvah is given to us by God, right? And our free will is: do we opt in or do we opt out? Um, so th- there's nothing that says the king decides all this. Well, or, or kings state. have kings have very broad powers. Um, in, in the Torah, uh, but we have something even stronger than that. We have mitzvahs. Okay. And, and, that should eliminate and the mitzvahs the come problem, from God. You know, yes. Uh, okay. Clearly, I don't think anyone is in favor of this idea where people could just loaf around and not do anything and then have all their needs met because no one benefits from that. No, they don't benefit from that, from that either. I think, uh, not to talk too much politics, but I think kind of smart welfare is probably better. Um, you know, this past week was the 20th anniversary of uh, the last wealth, welfare reform of 1996. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, I don't want to talk politics, but I, I do agree that it's not a good thing for people to be incentivized to do nothing. Right. No one benefits from that, not them, not society, certainly. Um, that being said, uh, here we're talking about a way of the world, like kind of the way of behavior. The way it is is if you don't have a job, you don't, right? If you don't take care of yourself, you won't be taken care of. That's what he calls the yoke of the way of the world. It's one mode of behavior that happens uh, in, in the world. Now what happens with the kingdom? What's the yoke of the kingdom? The yoke of the kingdom is, it's like a king. A king has police power. They can decide 
what happens? They could imprison people. They could force people to be conscripted into the army. They could force confiscatory taxes. They could do a lot of things, right? What happens when there's a king? The king has free will, so to speak. And his free will, he can make decrees, and we have to live by that. We have to abide by that. Correct? Right? We have to abide by that. Because we're subject to the whims of our ruler, of, our, of, of the king. And that means that the king says, you don't plant. You can't plant. Right? The king says, I, I'm taking 50% of, of your output. You're subject to him. So that's a kind of a second stream of, of how we can be treated uh, or, and how we have to behave, whereas we're subject to the king. So what it says that if you are kind of focused on Torah, say 50% confiscatory taxes would matter to you. Oh, so, then, so then there's the yoke of Torah, which is the third mode of behavior, so to speak, the Almighty himself kind of intervenes on our behalf and then says, you're not going to be subject to the way of the world. You're not going to be subject to the, what the king wants because I am personally going to take care of you. Right? If you accept upon yourself the yoke of Torah, then the Almighty is going to say that the, the built-in uh, rules of nature, so to speak, that demands that you've got to work really hard to make a living, I'm suspending that. The, the built-in allowance for free will of rulers to impose upon their subjects uh, that, that the world has, I'm going to suspend that as well. And now I'm going to treat you individually, so to speak. Can, can I, now, does that mean that they're saying that God is saying if, if it's okay to, to uh, disobey the king? Not necessarily, which means that you won't be sub- subject to that. So we, I, I found some very interesting examples. You'll be subject to that. Um, There's going to be an exception for you, Steve. <laughs> Let's see. What if the king doesn't like that? So I want to give you guys an example here. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter what the king wants, because the Almighty is more powerful than him. So, in other words, you, 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 you go to jail? Or no, you won't go to jail. Money watch over you. What Don't worry about it. If the king decides to put you in jail, you just you you'll, accept it and God will... No, no, like, you'll... Like you'll, ben you'll did. No, you'll be able to evade it. So I'll give you an example here. No, no, that's not the king. I'm, I'm, I understand. Okay. Right. He's more worried I want to give you guys an example, in, uh, a historical figure who did this. It depends on whether you have a benevolent king or a bad king. Well, I'm assuming the hypothetical is he's not so high. Okay. Yeah, well. And so then what? You know, uh, you know that's okay. So I'll give you an example, a historical example, well, of someone actually did this. Well, uh, well, I'll give you an example of someone who, who had to deal with all these matters and actually did it the whole way and see what happened to him. So the Talmud tells of Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon is one of the very colorful characters of the, uh, uh, of the Talmudic era, the early Talmudic era. And they're having a discussion, and the question is, do you need to get a job? Really? So quotes a verse, a verse we actually read a couple of weeks ago in the Parsha. It's part of the Shema. It says you should you work and you'll gather your grain. But that obviously presupposes that you're a farmer and the farmer plants and has to harvest and gather the grain and you have food to feed your family for the year. Wait a minute. Right? Why is the Torah telling us you gather grain? Of course you gather grain, right? Of course. What, what, like what insight are you telling me that oh, a farmer plants and has to harvest and gathers their grain? Like what's the lesson there? So the Talmud says that the verse elsewhere tells us that someone should never stop studying Torah. You gotta study Torah day and night. All the time you gotta study Torah. Never stop studying Torah. Maybe you think that you never stop studying Torah literally. You never stop studying Torah. Therefore it says, no, you should gather the grain. Find a way to harmonize a way, kind of the way of the world of having a job with Torah. So you gather the grain, but you also study Torah, and you kind of harmonize it all together. That's the way. Think about Torah while working. But the point is, you, you reconcile both of these. You find a way to do both. You have a job. You have responsibilities. You plant. You plow. You, you know, you, you, you toil over, o- over your job. You gather. But you also study Torah, and you find a way to harmonize the two. That's the opinion of Rabbi Yishmael. 
comes like Rabbi Shimon, a very colorful character. He says like this. What's going to be? A person is going to plow during the time of plowing and plant during the time of season of planting and harvest during the harvest season and grind, grind the wheat during the grinding season and winnow during the times of the wind. When will he ever study Torah? So what's his solution? Rather, when the Jewish people are doing the will of the Almighty, then their work will be done by others. And when the Jewish people are not doing the work of the Almighty, then the work will be done by themselves. And additionally, the work of others will be done by them. What he's saying is like this. When the verse tells you that you gather your grain, that's not ideal. Ideally, the other verse of you should study Torah, never stop studying Torah, that should be your only uh, mode of operation. What's going to happen? How are you going to feed your family? That work will be done by others. But if you are not studying Torah, if you don't have the yoke of Torah on you, then, then it says you gather your grain. Then you do the work yourself. You, when you're not in the will of the Almighty, then you'll do all the work yourself. So that's a disagreement. We have a, we have a conflict between two verses. One verse says you, 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 know, you work in the field, other, and the other verse says you study Torah all the time. So how do we reconcile these two? So it comes like Rabbi Yishmael, and he says you do both. Find a way to harmonize the two. Comes along Rabbi Shimon and says, no, no, no. These two are not supposed to go together. They're mutually exclusive. When the Jewish people do the will of the Almighty, they study Torah the whole time, and the work will be done by others. When the Jewish people do not do the work of the Almighty, then they have to do their own work, and not only that, the work of others is cast upon them. By the way, when, when, Rabbi, when Rabbi Shimon says, when they don't do the will of the Almighty, then their work will be their own responsibility and the work of others will be cast on them. What does that mean? The yoke of the way of life. You've got to work to feed your family. And the yoke of kingdom. The work of others will be cast upon you. You'll have to feed not only your own, your, 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 not, not only your own family, but the, all, all the other families around there. Right? You, I have to work to pay for someone else? doesn't make any sense. Right? Why should I have to work? You know, to, uh, to Steve's point here, why should I have to work to pay for someone else's family? Doesn't make any sense. Well, the Mishnah the tells you, the Talmud tells you. When you do not do the will of the Almighty, according to Rabbi Shimon, right, you, you don't have the yoke of Torah on your shoulders, then A, the way of the world will yoke, you've you got to work to feed your own family, and B, the yoke of the kingdom. Everything, everyone else is all your responsibility as well. You're going to do the work of other people as well. So that's a disagreement. And if it seems like our Mishnah. Is telling us that Rabbi Shimon is correct. Rabbi Shimon, who says, study Torah and let the Almighty worry about everyone else. The yoke of others won't be your responsibility. The way of the, way of the world won't be your responsibility. It seems like our Mishnah is in, very much in, in line with Rabbi Shimon. Now, I want to put a caveat here. So, it's a very interesting Gemara here. The, the way the t- Talmud here concludes, we have a disagreement between Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Shimon concludes the Talmud like this. How does the Talmud conclude? Many people did like Rabbi Yishmael. They tried to harmonize Torah study with working in the fields. They were successful. Many people tried it were successful. Many people tried like Rabbi Shimon. They tried to say, I'll do Torah and let everything else let the Almighty worry about every, uh, everything else, and they weren't successful. Should work. We're not. Now, if you study Talmud, you'll notice this is a very bizarre um, conclusion of a Talmud. Talmud says, we have a disagreement between two opinions. Well, let's see who's right. right. Very infrequently, infrequently are we going to go to the data and say, well, let's see the data. Let's see... Let's see what was tried and what worked, and what was tried and what didn't work. And not only that, it seems like from our Talmud that Rabbi Yishmael is more correct. Rabbi Yishmael says to harmonize the two, he's more correct. Whereas our Mishnah we just read, whoever casts upon themselves the yoke of Torah, then the, the yoke of the way of the world and the kingdom will, will be removed, that seems to be going like Rabbi Yishmael. So which one is it? 
So I think the answer is the answer is like this. The answer is both. They're both right. The truth is, for the majority of people, they cannot actually do it. The, the yoke of Torah is not an easy thing to achieve. It's not. And even the times of the Talmud, where people were much more connected to Torah and to the Almighty, a lot of people said, I'm going to try to do like Rabbi Shulman. I'm going to try to set up myself the yoke of Torah. I'll let the Almighty worry, worry about feeding my family. If you could actually do it, it'll actually work. But many people tried to do it, and they weren't successful. Not because that if they were successful, if they managed to accept upon themselves the yoke of Torah, it wouldn't work. It would work. It's just the yoke of Torah is very broad. It's very expansive. It's total commitment to Torah. If you have that total commitment to the Torah, then the Almighty will fill in for you. Then you'll have this other stream, this other mode of, of, of behavior where the Almighty will say, I'll intervene and I'll take care of your family. Most people can't do it. It doesn't mean that it's wrong, that his opinion is wrong. His opinion is right. But it's very hard to actually obtain, and thus many people tried it and failed. So if you're a professional Torah scholar and doing very well, but you're like 99%, not 100%. It's got to be a, well, well human. a yoke. You will That's fail right. just short of... Oh, yeah. So you, it's, hard to, it's hard to achieve it. And certainly if it was hard then, it's hard now as well. And there are no criteria when it's your... Well, yeah, okay, so that, that you know, which we try to give kind of definitions of what it means you're totally with Torah all the time, totally committed, regard, commit, committed regardless of interest. Yeah. Say your roof is leaking and you're a Torah scholar, you would not go, fi- if you go fix it before rains come, you are falling short of the total commitment. Well, let the Almighty redirect the rain elsewhere. I have a bias here. Okay. Great grandmother ran the farm, was a midwife, on shrimp, and raised the kids and kept cows also. The family story is she was going out to milk the cows one morning, had her baby in the field, delivered it herself, and then went out to milk the cows and came back while he studied Torah. That's a tough lady, so, huh? Wow. <laughs> and the funny thing is, my first cousin, also her great granddaughter, ended up delivering a baby on the North Way in New York. Oh, wow. So, well, it's a major road. It's a highway. Yeah, which highway? It's the north way. It goes from Albany up to uh, Canada. So anyway, somebody had to take care of that family. And because my great-grandfather, I mean, she may not have minded, but I mind on her behalf, was sitting and studying Torah all day. Everything was my great-grandmother's responsibility. But I'm sure, I'm sure she was glad to do it. She probably was. And maybe it did work out for him, right? And maybe she killed herself doing it. I don't know. You know that's, it's, it's a lot for what, what's clear is that this Mishnah is not, is not part of like Torah 101 for us. You know, This is not for beginners. But this is an idea that we can appreciate, but it's very impractical for us. In fact, even the Talmud says a lot of people tried to do it, they couldn't do it. By the way, Reb Shimon himself, what's his, uh, what's his bad story? So, the Talmud elsewhere, this is in the book of Shabbos, 33b, the Talmud records a, uh, a discussion that happened amongst three sages, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, and Rabbi Shimon, the aforementioned Rabbi Shimon. And they were talking about the Romans. The Romans, of course, were controlling the world at the time, and certainly the Jews. And they were saying... Now look how the Romans, they're so efficient, they built bridges, and they established bathhouses and marketplaces. And uh, like Rabbi Yehuda was like praising the Romans. And Rabbi Yossi was quiet. And Rabbi Shimon, he said, everything they did, they only did for themselves. There was no altruism whatsoever. They established marketplaces so they could have harlots. They, establishes, they established um, bathhouses so they could delight themselves, and they established, they built bridges so they could collect taxes. Don't talk so, so highly about the Romans. Everything they did, they did for selfish reasons. So what happened? Eventually this news of this conversation got to the authorities, and the authorities decided that Rabbi Yehuda, who praised the Romans, he's going to get a promotion. 
Rabbi Yossi, who was quiet, he's going to have to go into exile. And Rabbi Shimon, who disparaged the Romans, he has to be executed. So what happened? Rabbi Shimon went into hiding. And eventually, he ended up in a cave. And he went in the cave. And the next morning, the Talmud tells what happened. A carob tree sprouted out right at the at the, at the door of the cave and a stream of water came and him and his son actually spent 12 years in this cave and they sustained themselves from the carob tree and from the water What's a it's just a fruit tree, carobs it's fruits it's like an imitation chocolate. but uh, the Romans didn't find and them and the Romans didn't find them and this is a true story? this is a true story, yes now so God intervened, I assume, uh, to... Rabbi Shimon himself, he was the one who said that if you accept upon yourself the yoke of Torah, if you are committed to Torah, they, they might not take care of you. You don't take care of other people. Right. Right? And he was someone who actually lived, who practiced what he preached. And indeed we see, you know, he was so committed to Torah and to truth that when he was in exile, when he was hiding from the authorities... The Almighty says, it's my job to feed him. What I mean, normally streams don't just appear and characters don't appear. Yes, that's in the first kind of stream of behavior, whereas you're bound to the laws of nature, right? Or you're bound to the laws of what the king says. But if you elevate yourself to the highest level, uh, to, you, know, to, you know, to the highest and greatest mode where the Almighty is personally tending to you, is it a big deal for the Almighty to send you a stream of water? Absolutely not. No big deal. This won't happen to us because that's for us is a miracle. That's us being treated in a way that we don't deserve to be treated. And therefore, for us, it won't happen. But for him, it wasn't a miracle. That was just the way he all, all, you know, things always happened to him. Because he was someone who elevated his own personal behavior and commitment to God, and God responded in kind. I think the biggest miracle is that the Romans could not find a wanted man for 12 years in a pretty small area. Well, I'm sure the, cave, the caves are hard to find. Remember, the caves where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls were left uh, untouched for 2,200 years. So there's a lot of caves, and a lot of them are hard to find. Yeah, but they didn't stay in the ground for 12 years. Yeah. But there, you have the, the story of Akiva is a good one, too, how he became wealthy. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's a great, great example. But, 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 but the point is like this. When we read this, to us it's an idea. Like, this is very impractical for us. Like, we have to try to f- fulfill what Rabbi Yishmael says. Let's try to harmonize our Derech Eretz, our way of the world, along with our Torah. Uh, create maybe like a, like a, like a unity yoke. Where there, there, you know, we'll, let's try to have the yoke of Torah as well, so to speak, as a, you know, as a, a little mini yoke on our, on our backs. And that way, we could kind of try to have everything. Uh, but this idea, I think, is a very powerful idea that when you upgrade the way you treat the Almighty, the Almighty responds in kind and up, upgrades the way He treats you. There's many stories of miracles happening to the righteous that we know that they're, you know, that are not... Yeah, I've said the story before here. Like, this is, some, this is a miracle that happened in the 21st century. But it's not a miracle because it just... Miracles don't happen. It's just you, you're treated the way you deserve to be treated. Um, and this... Uh, this person's still alive. He's a great Torah scholar who's totally committed to Torah. Totally committed. In fact, every year he finishes all of Torah, including Babylonian Talmud, Jerusalem Talmud, Zephras, Free Michael, the Torah's Talmud, everything. Everything. He studies who, like 20... Who is this? His name is Rabbi Kanievsky. In Israel? In Israel. Remarkable, remarkable character. Studying Torah all day. And... Oh, he has a huge family. He, he raised like 13 kids in two, part, two now, bedroom apartments because I don't care about anything else, you know? Is he a follower of Rabbi Shimon? Or, uh, or He's someone who kind of is able to access Rabbi Shimon. How so? Well, do you know story what happened to him? He was studying a very obscure part of Torah that talks about zi- different kinds of grasshoppers. And... He didn't know exactly what the anatomy of this grasshopper was. And as he's trying to figure out what it was, a grasshopper jumps in his window and jumps on his book. And he's just able to look at it, and when he's done with it, it leaves. Like, that actually happened within a couple of years ago. And, but, but, like, this story happens all the time to him. It happens all the time. I gave the story of Rabbi Avadia. Rabbi Avadia passed away recently, in 2013. Rabbi Avadia Yosef, who was the Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel, 
uh, he's someone who had memorized verbatim tens of thousands of books in his head. An incredible genius, a Torah genius that we, that we haven't seen. He, like he could point, he had, he had a library of hundreds of thousands of books and he could tell you page numbers and start reading verbatim of, of most of them. Unbelievable. Oh, but commitment to Torah like you won't imagine. Uh, either way, um, after the, I think it was the Yom Kippur War, after the Yom Kippur War, Yom Kippur was a devastating war for Israel, and there was a lot of soldiers that were missing in action, missing, killed in action. They're missing, they're down. We don't know where they are. And then a lot of them were married. The problem is, if you don't have a, you don't have a cadaver, you don't have a dead body, how can the, his, the, the wife get remarried? So Bavadia took this, this, this project on to try to find either halachic loopholes or to use testimony to try to find a way of freeing these women uh, to get remarried. So he, what he would do is he would interview all the soldiers that were with him and find out all the details uh, and then sign off on a paper, you're allowed to get remarried. And when Rabbi Vadi gives you the paper, you're good to go. Get remarried, no problem. So there was a few cynical uh, journalists, a husband and wife tag team, and say, we're going to get him. We're going to get him. So the woman concocts a story that her husband was in the battlefield and she has a bunch of confederates who are part of her plan. Uh, and, they, uh, and they make a whole story that he was there and he, he, was, he was hit in action and he's gone and we don't know where he is and he's dead. We think he's dead but we don't have a body. And she went into a Bavadia and he asked her questions and this and that. And, uh, and, uh, and Rana says, sounds like good. So he signs off. This woman's allowed to remarry. So she walks out. She's like, this is the scandal of all scandals, right? The rabbi is now giving him this whole story. It's all concocted. It was all concocted. She's going to publicize me the biggest news, and he's going to be brought to shame. She's so excited. She stops by a pay phone, and she calls up the newspaper, and she's like, oh, you know, so excited. And, like, by the, and the guy tells her, oh, my gosh, we were trying to find you. Your husband was in a terrible car accident and is dead. And that story happened in 1973 or 1974. And that's the way it is. Like, Rabbi Vanya Yosef writes, uh, what's called, you're allowed to get remarried. That's just the way it is, you know? And you're going to try to shame him like that? No, there's, there's a higher power that works on his behalf in a different, there's a different mode of behavior that he has. A different mode. And, and, and you know, you want to start up with that. You have to deal with, what, with, with, you know, you want to stick your hand to the fire, into the oven. Sometimes you might get, uh, you might get burned. That's what's going to happen. And this is, this, is, this is a story we know who the people are. Like, this, this story actually happened. And this is, in, this is in modern times. The point is, is that as, I think the, the, the lesson that's, that's, that's for us is that, yes, our mission talks about accept one yoke of Torah. And to do that, in its entirety with, with the implications. you got to be like Rabbi Shimon. A lot of people tried it. They weren't able to do it because that's total commitment. It's total commitment. And for most people, that's beyond us. But I think there's kind of room in the middle where we, the more we upgrade the way we relate to God, the more he upgrades the way he relates to us. Of course... The nth degree of that is we're totally committed and thus God's totally committed to us. And therefore, we're not subject to the laws of nature, to the stream of the way of the world or the stream of the kingdom. Abraham, right? Abraham, we know. We know the story that he was cast into a fire. When someone's thrown into a fire, they die. Abraham didn't die. How did Abraham not die? He's a different human than us? No, he's the same human. It's just that the Almighty, the reason why someone dies if they get put in a fire is because the Almighty says... People that get put into a fire die. But that is kind of one way that the Almighty sets up the world. If someone is committed to God to such a degree that God becomes committed to him on an, on an individual level, then what, deter- what happens to that person is what God determines that happens to the person. And thus, this is an exception. So if this guy puts in the fi- it gets put in the fire, well, he doesn't fit into the first basket of whatever the laws of nature dictate. That's what's going to happen to him. He fits into the next basket, which says whatever God dictates... That's which basket he's going to fall into. Okay, God says, I don't want him dead yet. Throw him into whatever fire you want. It doesn't matter. You try to kill him, it doesn't matter. I'll decide when, when he goes because he's now in my basket and I'm treating him individually. Of course, 
that is the yoke of Torah to the degree that you actually lose the other yokes. I think to us, we can try to find a way to pivot a little bit, to kind of hedge, you know, hedge a, to, to, to edge a little bit closer to having more of a yoke of Torah and, and to the degree that we are able to accept upon ourselves the yoke of Torah, we will, the Almighty responds in kind and says, okay, the more you're committed to me, the more I'm committed to you. Uh, and who wouldn't want to have the Almighty watching our back? Uh, but of course, uh, there's no way for us to say we're not going to... We could have a stress-free free world, free, free world. You know, if you know the Almighty is watching you, the Almighty, the Almighty is taking care of you, how can you be worried about anything? You know, we read... Uh, that's in the Midrash. Uh, it, it, is, it is hinted in certain parts of the Torah, but it's not explicit. Well, but we know an example of the Tanakh, and the three that were thrown in. That's right. Hanadi, Mishal, Azariah, that's right. Or Daniel, four of them as well. So there are examples, are examples. Um, but the point is, is that, of course, that's not, if we get thrown into the fire, there's too much of the yoke of the way of life that's, uh, that's going to determine we're, we're dead. Uh, you know, because the Almighty is not going to individually treat us. That, that's for tzaddikim, for the righteous, you know. But we can become more and more righteous progressively, and the more righteous you become, the more the Almighty is going to have our back. Um, so I think it's, on one hand, of course, this idea is very theoretical uh, to us because, and the lesson, I think, is a very powerful lesson, uh, but I think it doesn't mean we should say, oh, I'm not going to reach the yoke of Torah. I'm not going to be like Rabbi Shimon or like Abraham or like Daniel or like Moses, the people that really have, have it to the furthest extent of, of, of the possibility of this idea. It doesn't mean we should say, I'm not going to try to do as much as I can or at least try to do what Rabbi Shmuel outlines and say, try to find a way to harmonize, to, to integrate Torah, to, to, you know, to, to put part of that yoke as well. Maybe you could have a half a yoke of Torah and half a yoke of the way of the world, and then the Almighty will kind of half watch over you. It's still pretty, pretty good if you could get it. Well, I think as a practical matter, the conclusion, I think it's the conclusion that both ways are right. Uh, that, you, you know, if, because the implication is, is it not that, I mean, as difficult as it is, both ways can work for certain, in certain situations, right? Yes, yes. So and that's why, that's why the Gemara says, doesn't, it doesn't give us a firm conclusion who's right. It says they're both right. A lot of people tried it and weren't successful because that's very hard to get to Rabbi Sh- what Rabbi Shimon says. And a lot of people tried the other way and that was a lot easier. Uh, but does that mean that it's not possible to get it? No, a lot, some people did try to, get, to do what Rabbi Shimon says and they were successful. Well, that's Here, the thing. You harm- I'll give you a practical <coughs> application. Since I, I studied this uh, about a month ago and in the next week at work, I, I had a day where I was like overwhelmed. An insane amount of work I had to get done. I had to create a presentation from scratch, deliver it to this one guy. I had to schedule all this trip. I had all these calls to make. I felt totally overwhelmed. So what I do? Put all aside. I study Torah for an hour because I thought about this per kale vote. Then all that work that was just like, how am I going to get all this done? I got knocked out in two hours. The, the presentation came together brilliantly quick. And then other things happen, and all this work just comes together. And I've done that several times where I felt overwhelmed. Nice. You know, so, so maybe we can have balance. it in, in doses. Yeah. So maybe like we cannot have, let's say, the whole thing in, its enti- in the entirety of our life, but maybe a little dose of this. Maybe that, that will work for us as well. So that's that, guys. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Lots of fun. Very interesting Mishnah. Very uh, challenging uh, idea. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Uh, we're going to do another Mishnah in Pirkei Avot. Uh, Also, very, very interesting Mishnah. I look forward to seeing you guys uh, then.